1943, before Goebbels wrote this, uh, in early 1943, uh, there was the Rosenstrasse protest of women on the streets. Uh, a few months later, according to the SD, there was uh, an uprising in a suburb of, uh, of Dortmund, uh, Herde, where, um, uh, where, where uh, a crowd spontaneously took the side of a, a man who the Gestapo was, was harassing and going to arrest and the Gestapo fled. Uh, and according to the, to the SD secret police reports, they used the same phrase that the women on Rosenstrasse were using. Uh, we want our men back or we want our husbands back uh, can be translated either way in German. So it shows that the rumors about the uh, protest in Rosenstrasse and the success of it must have been uh, coursing around Germany. Uh, and this is what Goebbels is saying. And I think it's November the 3rd, 1943, when he writes that uh, the people have learned where our flexible spot is. And if they push on that, we're pliable is the way he puts it. My argument is that the regime was trying to deport as many of these intermarried Jews as possible. Certainly all of the intermarried Jews, the non-privileged Jews who wore the Star of David, uh, that's the regime's uh, replication of that, uh, were to be deported. Then uh, 2,000 of them were rounded up among some 10,000 uh, Berlin of the last Jews in Berlin. In, uh, February 27th and, a few, and some days after that. And uh, they were brought to this uh, building in the Rosenstrasse. I think that the intention was to uh, send them to work camps and there was communication. They found out in fact that their husbands were there and they uh, made a decision that they would come back early the next morning and make a scene. Uh, and of course a scene in Nazi Germany was precisely uh, what the regime wanted to avoid, any kind of dissenting scene. Of course, it was strictly illegal for anybody to, uh, to, to move uh, collectively or aggregately without the Nazi party. And certainly not to openly challenge the Gestapo. Right. Well, exactly. And especially not on this issue, yeah. which was so fundamental to the Nazis, racial defilement was a crime in Germany that earned at least uh, some, or, you know, the death penalty, at least it was prohibited on pain of, uh, of the death penalty. And that's what these uh, intermarried couples were living in, in racial defilement. These women had been practicing all along and being forced to take steps of non-compliance and protest day by day since the beginning. They refused to divorce. I think that's the, the, we know that that's the linchpin because the Gestapo had a policy where as soon as a, a non-Jewish partner in these intermarriages would agree to divorce, they would deport the Jew. Or as soon as the non-Jewish partner died, they would deport the Jew from that marriage. So we know this is like, as one of the people told me, it was a silk thread that Jewish lies were hanging by. And she was uh, so aware of her role there. This was Elsa Holzer and, and, and at one point her family uh, exiled her and told her never to come back. And, uh, and so these were extremely uh, lonely people. If you read about theories of resistance, I think a good one is that uh, everybody who's in the front lines of resistance needs some sort of backup. People who aren't on the front lines, but willing to uh, give them some sort of encouragement, whether you know material or psychological. And uh, so uh, I'm not aware that these poor people had a lot of that, except for their partners, they had each other. They were not aware of each other. There was not a big network of intermarried uh, non-Jews in these uh, intermarriages. There was some, uh, but uh, on the whole, they met each other on the street and they, they described how this sense of solidarity began to develop as they you know, faced the Gestapo. Now, normally you would fear uh, entrusting anybody with your secret, but 
everybody on the street was clearly an ally yeah. willing to face it. And they talked about how the uh, solidarity uh, developed. And then uh, one Elsa Holzer talked about how at first they didn't, at first she didn't think that this was going to necessarily be successful, but they had to take action. She emphasized that they acted from the heart. If they had sat around discussing what to do, they wouldn't have done this, but uh, acted Beautiful. from the heart. And then they changed the context. They changed the conversation. All other forms of resistance that I know of were referred to conspiratorial, you know, popping up and destroying, which is also, of course, heroic and valid. But this was a form of, of conversing with the Gestapo. And one of the reasons it was successful was precisely because the regime knew exactly who these women were and, and knew what they were willing to put on the line. And essentially that from the beginning, they had paired themselves with their Jewish partners and with their fate. And uh, I will add that uh, <clears throat> by this time in the war, after, after so much uh, hardship and, uh, and decision to put oneself on the line that the conditions of war and of these, uh, you know, years of, uh, of deprivation had also trained them to put their lives on the line, not just to dissent, but there was also some uh, desperation, of course, but there was this need to take action. They were, uh, they, you know, they were trying to get them to, they were trying to intimidate them into separation. And, and this arrest combined with the SS in the whole brutal, context of a, a, a roundup and deportation was supposed to intimidate. It was a raised level of intimidation, but the women in, 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 in uh, response raised their own level of non-compliance through a street protest, which they hadn't done before. So many of us uh, studying uh, German history and looking for resistance have used other definitions uh, that don't integrate the day-by-day -day stand uh, integrate resistance into the daily life. And that's what these women did, I find is so important and, and shows civil courage, shows real civil courage because it was on display, it was public. I would say that protest still remains the uh, strongest uh, force for challenging authoritarian governments who are so concerned with controlling the media and images because they rule by images. <laughs>